you, and, and thank you to my friends at the ILS for allowing uh, the Harvard Law School Project on Disability to partner with you. Congratulations to my friends, Dr. Sanjay and Dr. Sumitra and Madam Yoshi. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. I very much enjoyed our visit together a few years ago when we also had the pleasure of Justice Yakub, um, which was marvelous. Um, so, all of 27 years of teaching in 10 minutes and what I've learned as an academic with a disability. All right. Um, the short version is that things have gotten better, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned, and outside the U.S. there are exciting prospects, but that in both places there's still a lot to be done. Um, for myself, since Sanjay Da asked me to speak from my own perspectives, uh, when I first went to law school, which was Harvard Law School, the same place I'm speaking to you from now, um, there was no access. And there was, of course, no Americans with Disabilities Act and no CRPD. Um, and so classrooms were inaccessible. Access to those classrooms uh, underground was not accessible. There were no accessible restroom facilities or eating facilities or learning facilities, including the library. Um, all that has changed, of course, um, and things have gone for the better. Um, as, a, as an academic with a disability, I also became the first person with one uh, to have been a member of the Harvard Law Review. My year was, was the year in which Michelle Obama was my classmate. Um, and two years later, a certain person named Obama um, became president of the Law Review. So now I have many students with disabilities who are on the Law Review. Uh, and I've spent some time this year working with the Law Review on making their write-on exam accessible so that finally persons who are visually impaired can have an equal shot at making the Law Review. Um, as far as teaching is concerned, you know, it's been three decades. And when I began teaching, there were only a very small number of people with disabilities out of, say, 2,000 or so American law professors uh, we only had a few who had disabilities and we only had a few who would teach in the area of disability law. Um, I'd like to say that they were encouraging and supporting and mentoring um, as far as my entering the legal academy, but the truth is that the lovely person you'll hear from in a moment, Peter Blank, to whom I'm eternally grateful for his friendship and support, um, was the only person with anything to do with disability law who encouraged me to teach uh, or to be a member of the academy who made efforts uh, to say, I'd like you to be a member of the academy. I'd like to have you as a colleague. Um, otherwise, I was largely ignored. And my mentors were always persons of color and women, um, people who understood what it was like not to have been included in the academy, what it was like to break the barriers, what it was like to look different, to teach different, and, and so on. Um, I will confess to you that I found it much less discriminatory and much easier to be a practicing lawyer for the five years that I did it than entry into the legal academy. Um, despite anti-discrimination laws, I was asked questions in interviews such as, um, well, you're interviewing here in the Midwest in Wisconsin, what is a person in a wheelchair going to do in the snow? Um, my referees were asked questions like, how is he going to be able to teach a large class? Whereas I had been teaching at New York University and Stanford Law School, two of the top five within the US and had among the best teaching evaluations at both those institutions um, and so on and so forth. Greater questions than that. Um, in the year 2000, uh, when I entered as a, as a tenure tracked law professor, um, was the first year that we saw any law school in the US actually include disability in their advertisements for faculty as one of their diversity criteria that they desired. First time in the year 2000. It wasn't until about the year 2003 that disability was included among the diversity numbers um, and, and groups within the American Association of Law Schools. So these things have come about gradually um, and, have, and have improved. Now we have, I would say, probably over 100, 150 people with disabilities and without disabilities who are teaching something in the area of disability law. Um, it's become much more popular in the law journals and in other publications. Um, it is still not 
the criteria that will get you hired. You still need to teach contracts or torts or another large first year, you know, common, common law subject. Um, but things have improved dramatically in that respect. Outside the US, we've also seen amazing accomplishments since the CRPD. You know, I'm very proud of my students who have come through Harvard and have gone elsewhere um, and who have had the chance to interact with. Uh, the first course on disability law in Korea is taught by Jay Wan Kim, who's now the vice dean at Sung Yung Kwan University. First course on disability law in Pakistan, taught by Dr. Marva Khan, um, another one of my you know, alums, another one of our, our graduates. First disability law clinic in China is a joint venture between Harvard and between Renda, and our graduate, Gu Roy, is teaching it. Um, so I'm very proud of, of the way that disability law is disseminated. Um, with another of my hats, um, you know, I'm an extraordinary professor at Pretoria, which is at the hub of the African Disability Law Network, which is linking together like a beautiful necklace um, across parts of, of Africa. Um, new disability law clinics, disability rights, disability rights courses, conferences, writings, and publications. Um, I try as much as possible to mentor students with disabilities uh, and those interested in disability law. I have a number of PhD students through my association with the uh, Free University, including some who have come through ILS in Pune, which I'm very happy to, to have had, uh, and many across the African continent. When permitted, I'm always happy to mentor or to interact with others. I had a wonderful day a few years back with Professor Lawson at Leeds, um, where I spent a day of office hours with the PhD students and the master's students coming through and discussing their work. And the same for uh, when there was a Marie Curie grant across Europe of students with disabilities interested in disability law. And I'm always happy to do that. Um, so the prospects are looking better. Um, they've increased. I think um, Professor Lawson might mention the new Disability and Social Justice Journal, which is going to be more intersectional and think broadly. Um, since Professor Fredman is you know, moderating, I should mention that one of my former students is the co-founder of the Oxford Disability Law and Policy Center, and we're very proud of that as well. So things have improved. People with disabilities and disability law as a subject are taken more seriously, um, but we have a long way to go. Um, disability is still frequently ghettoized. It's still frequently segregated. Um, it is difficult to see uh, or an, an untypical to see a person with a disability at a conference on commercial law or a conference on international law, sitting there providing their perspective either on disability law or on not disability law, just as far as being mainstreamed and being visible and being included. So we have a long way to go. I also recognize that anything that I have to say about the development of disability law in the US and some of its failings and some of its challenges um, is that I'm extraordinarily lucky and I'm extraordinarily privileged to be speaking from a developed context and extremely wealthy context with all the resources that, that exist. To put it all in, into context um, and to give you a, an idea, in 1985, when I went to Harvard Law School and interviewed and was told that none of this accessibility would exist and I said that, you know, it wasn't very welcoming or accommodating. Um, I was told that if I didn't like it, I could, four letter word we never use at Harvard, I could go to Yale. Um, 15 years later when I returned and I was teaching disability law and I described these things to my students, students who had grown up with national level disability laws, national level access to education laws, they looked at me as if I was crazy. Um, and that's beautiful. That's beautiful because in 15 years, we've had this complete culture change from, well, how can you possibly have a law professor or a law student with a disability to how could you possibly not have it? And why would you think that that is, that is strange? So that's been a wonderful culture shift. Um, in the prompts that Dr. Sanjay gave me, I guess one thing I should mention is, you know, he asked, have I experienced prejudice? I mentioned in the hiring process, um, I am in disability, I guess, what my predecessors, sisters, and, and brothers um, are in other contexts, and that is I've always overproduced. 
The only accommodation I've ever received in teaching has been to be in an accessible classroom, although there are times I've had to make classrooms accessible by being bounced up and down stairs. Um, Peter can correct me, but we would say probably a productive top-level law professor might produce 40 or 50 pieces of scholarship across her career. I'm already well above 200. So I've always done the perspective of needing to overcompensate, being more interested in things, having to overproduce. And yet, of course, there still remain lots of challenges, such as um, Professor Fredman rightly received a, a lever Hume and did a marvelous job. I love your book, Sandy, um, that came out of that. Uh, but I will recall that when I was nominated for it uh, about a decade ago, uh, the then dean at the Oxford faculty declined the request on the basis that no one would be interested in disability law. It wasn't an area which would be of interest to others. Um, and just to be fair handed, because my PhD is from Cambridge, the then chair of the law faculty at Cambridge, who was allegedly a human rights lawyer, said the same thing. So we have a way to go as far as being accepted. We've made tremendous, tremendous accomplishments. Um, the people who are writing now in their 30s and 40s, the young guard, are marvelous. I mean, they're absolutely marvelous in generating wonderful projects. And there's this real sense of community and real sense of collegiality on the international level for it. So I'm very happy about what we have to see in the future. So thank you very much for having me. I'll try to keep us on time by stopping now, and it's a pleasure to join you.